together after the invocation. We'll pray then together Luther's morning prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, what I want to do here today is I'm going to start here by just kind of a quick finish up here where we were last week. I had a race here, the Roman Catholic view, but we'll just put up kind of for the sake of the one stop shop here. The Roman Catholic view is there's no forgiveness in the sacrament, and then we've got there's there's no forgiveness over here either. And so we kind of said there isn't in the Calvinist view for the most part either actually by what you receive in your mouth. It's a spiritual evil. So we kind of sit here in the Lutheran view kind of as the lone, the lone ranger with regards to the real presence of Christ. And I want to, and I want to read something here, and turn and find it, from Christian Dogmatics. This is written by Francis Pieper, well over 100 years ago, but he was our synodical president, president of the seminary in St. Louis for, I think, close to 50 years. But all seminarians have to go and read this four-volume set. This big thing titled Christian Dogmatics, Dog, Christian Doctrine, Christian Teaching. And I found this quote as I was reading about some other things this week and hear about the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, but especially the Roman Catholic Church with regards to why they remove forgiveness from the Lord's Supper. I'm just going to read it in two sentences. The Roman Catholic Church removes the forgiveness of sins from the Lord's Supper with an anathema. I read that from the Council of Trent. If anybody says that the principal thing you receive in the sacrament is the forgiveness of sins, let him be eternally condemned and sent to hell. So the Roman Catholic Church removes the forgiveness of sins from the Lord's Supper with an anathema as we approve by a quotation from the Council of Trent. Why Rome so energetically eliminates the forgiveness of sins from the Lord's Supper is quite understandable. And this is the big sentence. The kingdom of the Pope stands and falls with its doctrine of the uncertainty of the remission of sins. <laughs> the kingdom of the Pope. That's, that's an incredible statement from one of the kind of main guys that's a founder of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, not at its beginning, but as it kind of grew, Dr. Francis Pieper, is that the whole uncertainty is what allows the Roman Catholic Church to continue. Now, as we finished last week, I said the interesting thing is the Protestant Church and my Baptist friends would be kind of appalled by me saying it, but they're, they're, they're pretty much in exactly the same position, which is why over here, but they don't have the sacraments. Over here, you've got revivals and everything else, because you can never be what? You can never be sure. You can never be sure. And it's kind of an amazing thing when some of my Protestant friends will come to a Lutheran church service, or they talk to me about a Lutheran church service. One of the things they say is, I will never be a Lutheran, ever. Because of what you guys do at the start of your church service. There's no way in the world the pastor can stand up there and say, I forgive you all of your sins. There's no way the guy can do that. And that's why it's great what you guys do. Thank you for Martin Luther and everything else. But you guys are entirely blessed. There's no way in the world the guy can say, I forgive you, number one. But to then use the three letter words, all. I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's no way. You, you just don't know for sure. You don't know for sure about everybody out there. 
that statement can't be made. Which again is kind of the interesting thing is it was Jim who kind of was talking to me after church here after first service and said, what were you doing some reading or something? Oh, yeah. it, was a, it was a Muslim Christian who said, you guys who've grown up in the Christian church do not understand this thing called forgiveness and the amazing thing that you have. And, and it really is, I think, for us here as Lutherans, that you have the assurance, you come to church and you hear those words, all of your sins are forgiven. That's not some, not maybe forgiven, might be forgiven, possibly forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. That you, that you hear that. that. That is an amazing thing. And as Lutherans, that's what we say the church is all about. That's why it exists. I'm not here as a cop to check on you to see what your sins are, if you're truly repentant, or put you on an anxious bench in front of church and make you sweat. You know, and I'm not, I'm not going to you know, say your sins are forgiven until I really see you sweat and cry. Then, I might say that you're forgiven. But if you come and hear that your sins are forgiven, that is true and an amazing thing. And, and as Francis Pieper says here, I, I think he's right on it. What keeps these two things going is the fear, am I Am I forgiven? That was Luther's great fear. Am I forgiven? Here, you come and you hear your sins are forgiven. You come to the sacrament, take the eat, take the drink, the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you. Not for some of you, but now you're giving it for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. You hear it over and over and over again. These two camps over here would sit here and say, I just, how, how do you know for sure this is that and the other thing? And, and Lutheranism is, uh, what does is, what is the Bible say? Your sins are forgiven. One of, one of the great things, I, I reference this a lot, and it truly did have an impact on me as a kid. Watching, I think it was on NBC, back when I was second grade or third grade or whatever, with Jesus of Nazareth and Nazareth Miniseries. That was, when I was a kid, my grandma and my, my mom and aunt were big into all those miniseries. You know, it came out with north and south, east and west, how the west was going, you know, all the, and then, you know, you go over to Grandma's house, and they all sit there and watch them all. Well, some of them I got into, some of them I really didn't, but the Jesus of Nazareth one really did beat my interest, and really impacted me, and I always, that's why I think my kids suffer through it every once <laughs> and we watch it during Holy Week, the whole kid caboodle. But, um, that scene with the woman caught in the altar. Where she's there, they're all going to stone her. Was it John 8? And everything else. I was thinking about that this week. And then it's just an amazing scene that uh, Franco Zeffirelli, who did Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, has Jesus there. And the woman, you know, everybody's going to kill her and everything else. And then Jesus says, Well, it's great. You guys have at it. He was, you know, without sin, cast the first stone. And then they all leave. And then Jesus turns to her, you know, she's cowering up against the stone wall. She's afraid she's going to die. And, and Jesus goes, is there anyone left to condemn you? And she said, no. And then Jesus says, well, neither do I. And then he, he inserts this statement of absolution, which is truly amazing. He's, Jesus says to the lady, your sins, and he says, which are great, and are many. All are forgiven. Go and sin no more. And it's just... It's an amazing uh, piece of uh, cinema there, uh, how that's all set up and the tension is there. But that's truly what Christianity is all about. We have everybody else here ready to con condemn this woman. And Jesus steps in and says, in all of your sins, and they are many. And I love that little line that he inserts. And they are many. All of them. Now go and sin no more. And it's, it's, just a, it's just an interesting thing. But that's, that's what Lutheranism is all about. Is Luther really went wild for him with the words of institution on two things. Number one, for you. And number two, as we've seen in the Catechism, for the forgiveness of sins. And I, and I was thinking about it this week too, about something that really kind of 
impacted me as a young pastor when I was out at the side of the church in Aspen, Colorado, where I was there for probably three Sundays, and we had had communion for those three Sundays, <clears throat> and we had a, a guy in his mid-60s, Russell, he's not with the Lord, just a true saint, but he was always the usher, last one to receive the Lord's Supper. Every time I, I came by, and uh, he took the common cup, we had individuals in the common cup, but I'd come by with the host, and one of the elders would have the, the common cup, and, and I'd put down it, and I'd give the blessing, and he was there, and these are the last couple of people um, who was there, sometimes he was even there by himself after everybody else had, had taken the Lord's Supper, but you would just see him just crying, and just the tears were coming down his eyes, and it's kind of like, it's kind of interesting, I hope I haven't done it, and it showed up, and this guy was just, in the 60s, just crying, weeping. So, as just kind of bothering me for a few weeks, well, on the third week, after the third Sunday, phone rings in the office. Hey, Pastor, this is Russell. Um, there's kind of some silence. He goes, uh, you probably wonder why I cry when I take the Lord's Supper, don't you? And I said, well, Russell, it has crossed my mind. It has crossed my mind. I have no step. He goes, well, I think it'd probably be a good thing if I come in and talk to you. And I said, great. Why don't you do that? So he came in and talked to me. He's from Chicago, came out to ask him to live the party life, ski, do all that stuff back in the 60s. Got involved with the party scene, got involved with also the gay party scene in um, Aspen. And uh, his partner, whom I eventually met when I was there, was an was, uh, ex-partner, I should say, it was dying of AIDS. But um, uh, he, he'd been through a lot, and I'm not divulging anything that nobody knew. I was the only one in the congregation that didn't know. Everybody else knew Russell's story. He was a part of AA, come and meet at our congregation. He would give this kind of personal testimony. Everybody knew it, but I was new to the scene and didn't know it. And, I mean, Russell it, it was just like the woman caught in adultery. He came in my office and he said, Pastor, my sins, I'm not going to divulge them all. But here's kind of my story that I, everybody in the congregation knows, most of the people in the community know. Here is my story. And he goes, I grew up Lutheran in Chicago, I wandered away, got involved in X, Y, and Z with all this stuff. And then I hit rock bottom and uh, went to AA, had some other things, my uh, ex partner, uh, had AIDS, and it just everything blew up. I came back to church, talked to the previous pastor, got involved back in church again, and to hear the words and to receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. You don't know what that truly means to me. That my sins and their men are truly what? Forgiven. And that's why when I come to the altar, and until the day that I left, you would see those tears coming down his eyes. It's truly an amazing thing. But it's Lutherans. I think that's what we need to really zero in on is that we rejoice and as I've written down here, the beauty and clarity of those words of Jesus, this is the body and blood of Christ for what? The forgiveness of sins. And I think we're sitting in a unique position here in Lutheranism. It was Kurt kind of after Thursday's endowment committee meeting, kind of like we had the, the Bible study after the Bible study, <laughs> where people stay around for another hour and questions. We kind of had a Bible study after the Thursday endowment committee meeting, where some people stayed around and talked. But, you know, Kurt says as a dentist, I talked to a lot of people, this, that, and the other thing, and they're just burned out and beat up from, from this and from religion. Have I done enough? What do I need to do? This is what I'm supposed to do. And they're, just, and they're just burned out. Is that kind of a fair? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the quick 10-second version of it. But people are, are just burned out by it because this is what they're getting on both ends of the spectrum and in non-Christian religions. But here we're sitting, this is something truly, I don't think, this is Jim saying here today, I don't think we understand how unique this is. That for the forgiveness of sin, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. Because it, are we dealing with a control issue with the Catholics and the Protestants, and that just like Jesus dealt with the scribes and the Pharisees? And the Pharisees. Yeah, you, 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 need, you need us, and you're never totally really sure. And most of you aren't going to make it on the first shot, but then there's purgatory. Well, you'll purge away the sin, and then 
you know, and then you'll get righteousness. Maybe somewhat, but it's just it's just the system of it's even within Christendom, you see the gospel is it's what Kurt said. It can't be this it can't be this easy. It's yeah. almost too good to be true. Yes, sure. And uh, it is. So what they do, do they get stuff from it is finished on the cross, and you as a man are not enough, or there's a conflict between total forgiveness. It is, because it's just, there's got to be something that I've got to do. There's got to be something I've got to do. And it's with the sermon today, well, if you want to do it, you got to kill yourself. You, 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 would have to, you would have to whack yourself. It's the only way you can't, you can't do it. You can't, number one, get rid of all your sin, because you're the problem. And number two, as I talked about in Bible study Thursday morning, even if you could do the law of God, as Jesus has in the parable with the master and the servant, after the servant has done all that he's supposed to do, don't come in and ask for a reward because you've only done what you were supposed to do. Just like I said, there's nobody going to pull, and I will do it today, nobody's going to pull you over on the way home when the lights come out and the car, cop comes out and says, I want your registration. And I, you know, I want your driver's license and your insurance card. And you're like, well, I was only going 28 on Michigan Street. I, there's no way in the world I can get a ticket. Oh, you're right. That's why I pulled you over. I'm not giving you a ticket. I just want your address because I'm going to give you a certificate. You're going to go to Mayor Listenberg's office. Mayor Listenberg will meet you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in his office. He's going to give you a $1,000 check for not speeding. You don't get a reward for doing What's right? You're only doing what was required of you. So this, this whole idea that I should get a reward for doing something good, and that somehow I can get rid of my sin, is ludicrous because you can't achieve any of them. And even if you could, we're only back to square one. It's got to be God's grace. These religious leaders are leading these people down the wrong path. So are they going to become responsible for those people's sins? Because they're causing these people to sin and not giving them so what the Scripture says that's a you, should, you, should, you should be very careful to become a pastor right. and a leader okay. because you'll be judged more harshly because sure. you're dealing with the eternal things of God. So you better be really careful what it is that you're teaching. Because this would be like a millstone causing these little ones. One of the little ones. Because we're all little ones. Yes. To be drowned in the sea. Yeah, from our gospel reading here today. Yeah, you better be real careful what you teach because, yeah, it's, we're not dealing with whether you get a refund on your taxes this year or not, or how much the refund's going to be. We're, we're dealing with where you're spending eternity, smoking or non smoking. And that's, I mean, that's some, that's some pretty severe stuff. That, that kind of is a, is a heavy burden, I think, sometimes for. For, for pastors to carry. But here's the beautiful thing. It, it goes to John 3, 16 and 17. God loved the world that He gave His one and only Son or believes in Him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then 17, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Why? Because the world stands condemned already. You're already going to hell out of the gate. So He's not come, he's not come to send you to hell. He's come to Saved. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. But I wanted, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it is again as I was reading, contemplating, and meditating on it this week, I think as I said last week, for somebody who's grown up in this, and this is the air that they breathe, we don't see this, this incredible beauty. I don't know what Jim said. We don't see the beauty of what we really have. Uh, but when I listen to people talk, it's like they they lure them in with the gospel, and then once they get them in, they beat them up with the law. <laughs> to, 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 to keep you in. Keep them there. Yeah. You know, to yeah. Keep them there. I mean, that's they have a beautiful so gospel to get them converted. Yeah, and so then bad. after that, we've got to have all the laws to keep you in. Yeah. You know, I'm so bad. I can't do all this stuff. I can't do so, this, you know. It's like the forgiveness was there at the beginning, but then we lose it. And the forgiveness is only for the people outside the church. And we'll give them the forgiveness when we get them in. And then for those who are already in, well, then we're off and running something else. And that's, yeah, and that's not what the church, the church is always there to give the forgiveness.
forgiveness of sins. So now I'm going to tackle the next question here. And let's go to the Catechism. Let's go to question 3, page 1347. 1347. 1347. How can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? What I want to focus in on, because I'm trying to answer, I'm trying to deal with the Catechism here, but then also deal with questions that I receive as well. Well, Lord willing, we're going to finish up next week with the Catechism and the Lord's Supper. Unless I get a whole load more questions, but we're going, to, we're going to try to answer these questions. But it fits, this question fits so well, and it's a, it's something that is constantly thrown at Lutherans. And that is, aren't you cannibals if you say Jesus is really, really present there? If this truly is his body and blood, and if that's what you're eating and drinking, then aren't you a cannibal? And isn't that against Scripture? And we see it here in the question. How can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? And that bodily is a twofold. It's you're, you're eating the body and blood of Christ. But the body and blood of Christ is on actually now in your body. But, but notice Luther's answer there. It's certainly not just eating and drinking. So Luther admits we are eating and drinking what? Body and blood. The body and blood of Christ. It's not just eating and drinking, but the words. It's always the word given and shed for you. See, that's where it always goes. For you. For the forgiveness of sins. These words, along with the body of eating and drinking, are the main thing in the sacrament. Whoever believes these words has exactly what they say. Forgiveness of sins. So the, so the big question here is, as I have asked, what type of eating and drinking is it? Luther says it's a body eating and drinking. So what does that mean? Are we cannibals? What, what are we eating and drinking? I want to go back here to something that we've got here. In, uh, you guys, just kind of like on Thursday, we had... Uh, as we dealt with Melchizedek, you kind of got a seminary education. You're going to get a little bit of one here again today. Because I'm going to let people who are a lot better at this than me answer these questions. So I'm going to let uh, our Lutheran confessions here, Luther and Francis Pieper, here kind of answer this. What, what type of eating, and then also Martin Kemp, it's the second Martin, which we'll get here in a moment, put together the formula of Concord in our Lutheran confessions. What are we eating and drinking? This is what Francis Pieper says here. He says, against this whole idea that we're cannibals, we must maintain this. Yes, the whole Christ is present, of course, as in the universe. Wherever Jesus is, there is bodies. So also, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Wherever Jesus is, there's his body and blood. The whole Christ. So, but against this, we must maintain, yes, the whole Christ is present, of course, in the universe. So also in the church, and in all rites of the church. But, not in the Lord's Supper. That's an interesting thing. Not the whole Christ. Now that maybe is kind of a weird thing to hear, but let, let's, let's hear him out on this, and then let's, let's hear out what our Lutheran father said, dealing with Scripture. But in this sacrament, Christ gives something to be eaten and drunk with the mouth. And that is not the whole Christ. But Christ's body and blood, as the words of institution read. Jesus does not say, take, eat, and drink my whole, my whole body. This is my body, take and eat. This is my blood. In the Lord's Supper, we therefore receive with our mouth no more and no less than Christ's body and blood. Now, to help us understand this, I'm going to read to you here, now is where you really get a seminary education. From this book, The Lord's Supper, by Martin Kemmons. As I said at the end of last week, the Roman Catholic Church and the Council of Trent said if it wasn't for the second Martin, doggone it, the first Martin would have been for. He would have died, and there would have been no Lutheranism, and it just would have been on its way. And it would have been over with, and we would have been done with it forever. But the second Martin came along, who was taught by Martin, 
Concord. And he was the one that helped put together the Book of Concord and the Formula of Concord. One of his great works is on the Lord's Supper. And he answers this question. This is considered to be kind of the big book here that you read. And we're going to use this in a couple of spots. But I, I want to read here what he says. He says, on the basis of the words of institution, there's different types of eating going on in the Lord's Supper. First, you eat of the bread, which is rightly and properly called a physical eating. Do you eat bread? We know that when we read 1 Corinthians. Remember, don't you know that the bread you eat is the body of Christ? Don't you know that the cup that you drink is the blood of Christ? Paul says. So he says you're eating bread. That's what Chemnitz says. There's a physical eating. Second, there is also the eating of the body of Christ, which although it does not take place in that physical or gross way, according to the words of Christ, it does take place though orderly. For he says, take me, this is my body. This is called a sacramental eating. So there's a physical eating. Then there's also what our Lutheran fathers call a sacramental eating. Now, then he goes to some church fathers, Augustine and Cyril, and they talked about these people who were of the opinion that if it was the body of Christ that you were eating in the sacrament, then what we were doing was cutting up into small pieces the body of Christ to be given to eat, just as the flesh of cattle is sold in a meat market and cooked and eaten. But, it says here, Christ criticizes these people sharply. And St. Augustine would often reject this concept of cannibalism by saying, does the rest of the food go through the digestive process? God forbid. Likewise, Luther, always and everywhere, particularly in the Book of the Word, declared that when he taught that the body of Christ was eaten in supper, he did not understand this to mean that it took place in a visible or perceptible way, so that the actual substance of the body of Christ would be torn with your teeth chewed up or butchered, chewed up in the mouth, swallowed, digested, and changed into the substance of our flesh and blood in the way other food is. Can I understand what he's saying? You're, you're eating the body of Christ, but it's not like you're eating steak. You're, you're eating it in this special sacramental way. Same thing as we're going to talk about here in a moment. How long does the body of Christ stay there in that wafer? Now, it's not that I can take that wafer run down to the lab here after a church service, take it to the lab at the hospital, and say, please test it and find the DNA of Jesus. <laughs> You're not going to be able to what? Find it, because as Luther says here, it's not the same way that you can find the DNA of a cow when you eat a steak. It's not the same thing. It's there, but not in the same way. How does that happen? Mr. I don't know. Is what Luther will say. It's got to be. It is, but it's not the same way as you eating a steak. We're not cannibals here, to where we're actually chewing on, all right, the actual, you know, body of Christ as if we're eating a steak or having a hot dog or so forth. So it goes on to say we must rightly and necessarily acknowledge and believe that in the supper there is more than is just a spiritual eating, as you would say over here. Or over here, you're, you're eating bread and drinking juice and you're spiritually remembering Jesus who's far away somewhere. No, 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 no. We don't, we don't go with this and we don't go with this. We're in the middle. We're in the middle. There's more going on here than just a spiritual eating. There is also the sacramental eating. It's a special type of eating of the body of Christ as the ancient church so correctly called it. And yet it is not something merely figurative or imaginary, but true and substantial, even though it occurs through a supernatural, heavenly, and unsearchable mystery. Although we are not able to demonstrate or understand how this takes place, it suffices for faith simply to believe what the words of Christ teach us in the words of institution in their proper and natural sense. That the physical mouth of those who eat in the supper are not eating common or plain bread when they receive the bread. Because what does Paul say? Don't you know the bread you eat is the body of Christ? Don't you know the cup you drink is the blood of Christ? So it, there's more than just you know eating common plain bread when we receive the bread. But the bread which now has been given its name by God, that is the body of Christ. That is to say, 
It is bread with which the body of Christ is truly and substantially, although in a supernatural way, present and distributed. And God accomplishes this not by some physical and outward mixing of the substances or by joining something to the food in our stomachs, but in a way whereby it becomes a heavenly and spiritual nourishment for both body and soul of the believers unto eternal life. He accomplishes this in a manner which is known to him alone, who is the author of this tremendous mystery. So where does Martin Kevin finally leave it? With God. With God. I, I don't know exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, I, I, I'm having some, because here's what happened over here on this end is they said, if you guys are going to say you're chewing on the, on the body and drinking the blood of Christ, you guys, here was, the, here was the accusation from this end. You guys are nothing more than a bunch of pagans. You guys are nothing more than a bunch of pagans. Lean not on your understanding, but trust in God. Trust in God. We just go with the word is. And you read Luther in the large catechism, this is my body. Leave it. It's there in some sort of spiritual way. How does it get there? When you read the large catechism, the Word. Just like God created everything, called it into existence by the Word. What makes a baptism? It's not plain water. There's plain water, but it's not plain water because the Word's connected to it. It's not just ordinary water. Now, it's ordinary water with something else added, which is the Word, which makes it now ordinary, but not ordinary. And that's what we've got here. It's ordinary bread and wine, except I wouldn't call it bread, it's a styrofoam wafer. But that's that's it's it's bread, it's unleavened, but it's it's now contained in with an under. It's why we never say just in it. Luther would always say it's in it, it's with it, it's under it, it's in this, it's in this mystery. It's in this mystery, and we leave it there. We can never understand it with our thoughts. And we ought no way to investigate it with our minds. This is how the section closes. When our physical mouth receives the bread and eats it, we can truly say and believe that our mouth, at the same time, very important for Lutherans to say you're receiving the body and blood of Christ in your mouth, not with your heart, or not that you're taken by the Spirit into heaven, but you're actually receiving it in your mouth. So when... When our physical mouth receives this bread and eats, and we can truly say and believe that our mouth at the same time also receives and eats the body of Christ. Although this does not take place in the same kind of physical way in which bread is eaten. The sacramental eating of the body of Christ, which of necessity, must take place in the supper, if we do not want to reject the proper and natural meaning of the words of the last testament of Christ, which is the words of institution. So... How, how do we truly understand this? No. We don't. Shirley's right. We don't. Other than we take the words is and we and we leave it. I need to tell you this, Pastor. Man, no, I have to tell you. We cannot communicate this with our buddies. No, that's it. But we can send them to church. Go to, go to Calvary. Okay, come to church and, get it and just the bottom line as Luther said, if you want to get to the end in the large catechism, the bottom line, three things. Is means is. It's there. I don't fully grasp it or understand it. It's there because of the words is. It's there for you. So you're getting it. And it's there for the forgiveness of sins. Leave it there and leave it as comfort. You try to figure it out, you end up over here or you end up over here, and you end up neglecting the clear words. I may not understand how it happens, but it's clear. Is means is means is, and it's for you, and it's for the forgiveness of sins. And it is a sacrament, which the word actually means mystery. Mystery. Could it be that the body and the blood is feeding our soul, and the bread and the wine is feeding our body? Yeah. It, it, Mike says, is it, you know, is it the bread and wine feeding the body, body and blood feeding the soul? You know, people have tried to use that. Um, I, I always try to say, I mean, yes and no. So that's, that's a good Lutheran answer. You can't attach it to No, you can't. You can't. And, and we have in the right, for those of you who 
I come and give you communion when you're in the hospital, a nursing home, or so forth, recovering from a surgery, we have with the pastoral care companion. And we pray that this heavenly food, which George has received, will strengthen his faith. That it has fed the body and the soul. I mean, there is that in that closing post-communion collect that our synod puts out in the pastoral care companion for giving the Lord's Supper to the sick. It's, it's there. Um, is it in the Bible? <clears throat> well, yes and no. <laughs> That's always a good Lutheran answer. Yes and no. Um, but it, it depends how you want to go there. Because if, as I was reading Kevin's this week, he goes through the scriptures in our confessions and, and says there are those three types of eating. There is the, there's, as I, I just gave you two, but he goes three. There's the physical, you're eating bread and wine, as Paul says. But your soul is receiving something else. And there's that sacramentally eating, which is also a spiritual eating. But that spiritual eating you can also get by the word that feeds the soul. So there's a whole scene, you, you, you kind of, why I'm hesitant to do this is once you start having all these distinctions, then you can kind of, yeah, things can get a little bit haywire sometimes. Why I'm even hesitant to kind of go down this road today and read all that stuff to you makes me a little leery. But I think we kind of have to know that this is all out there. And you may run into somebody one day who will tell you that, as I have. Well, I'm not going to become a Lutheran. I'm not a cannibal. There's no way in the world that I would ever eat and drink the body and blood of Christ. I'm not a pagan. So they would accuse us of pagan rituals, which is what the Romans actually did with the Christians at the beginning of the church. There's graffiti you can find on the walls of ancient Rome that say the Christians have these secret rites and they're pagans and they go and they're cannibals and eat the body and blood of Christ with cartoons. I mean, so it's it's been there from the from the very beginning, and it's and it's still out there. Yes, Gene. John six gives a good explanation where Jesus himself talks about him being the bread of life, and then true the, real food. That's right. Who can understand this? Yeah, and so he himself explains that after feeding the five thousand, and I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven. Whoever the reference, me. the reference to the Old Testament lesson today about the. The Jews eating manna on the field that, that can sustain them forever. They still die, but Jesus is right. alive to sustain us for eternal life. And all the people run away from him and say, This is hard to understand. This is this is this is this is very hard. Who can who can get it? And we accept it. Why? Because as Luther would say, the clear words of scripture, we don't try to figure it all out, and we just leave it where it is. Somebody else had to be Chester. With God, all things are, are possible. Are possible. Yep. No, you're exactly right. Just as he called the world into existence. Just as he died on the cross and rose again. Yes, Anne. When we take communion, we're told it's for the forgiveness of our sins. Right. We are already forgiven. Correct. So is this like a celebration of that forgiveness? That's a great question. The answer says, we've already been forgiven at the start of the service. We should have. I forgive you all of your sins. A lot of times you'll hear it in the sermon. Sometimes in our meetings. Why are we coming up again? Have we sat here in church and just really muddled the whole thing up and sinned grossly in the last 20 minutes and I need another round of forgiveness again? You know, I can't sin too much in church now, can I? Yes. No, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, Luther, Luther tackles that. We're going to get to that because that's a question next week. Is the final question, what makes a person worthy? How, how often do I need to take it? And, and so forth. And can I get forgiveness in other places? If I can, why does Christ give us the sacrament? The, the quick answer here is I can hear it orally, but maybe that's not for me. And God is always trying to find every way available to get to you to give you comfort. And here now, it's put in you, and it's in you personally. And it's, it's just a different, it's called the sacramental presence now. It's a different way of providing forgiveness. He's always trying to find, because he loves to connect his word of promise to earthly stuff. To continue to find every way possible to give you comfort. He said, do it as often as you do. As often, yeah. In remembrance of me and what I have done for you. Yep. Yeah. If I 
it's clearly different because if it was the body and blood divvied up into minuscule portions, there still would be nothing then left for the next time. Yeah, it keeps going over and over and over again. Yeah, there is something different that I think our Lutheran fathers recognized as did people in the beginning of the early church. It doesn't taste like blood. You know what blood tastes like. It, it, it doesn't taste like blood. But the blood is is there. Why? Because the word is. Yes, and then we'll move on, Jan. Did you answer the question about how long that lasts? That's the next question. Here it is. That's the next one. That's where we're going. How long is it the body and blood of Christ? How long is the body and blood of Christ in with another than the bread and the wine? How long is it present there? Okay. A couple of things here I want to use again. I don't want to use my word, but what you do? I'm, I'm going up the food chain here. I'm going to go to Martin Kemnitz, not from his book on the Lord's Supper, but from the Formula of Concord. He puts this together. This is the document that brought the Lutheran Church together after Luther's death in 1580. I'm going to go over to the Formula of Concord. And, and it kind of answers this whole thing to a certain extent by using the words of institution. All right, so here's what the Formula of Concord said. This is Article 7 of the formula, solid declaration. But this blessing or recitation of Christ's words of institution, by itself, if the pastor just says the words, is the body and blood of Christ there? That's an interesting question. Now, why are they why are they asking that question? Because we have to believe. Because the Roman Catholic Church would have the words of institution. That the pastor then, the priest, would, would do his thing, remember, where he would then change the bread. All right, Hocus Corpus Meum, where we got the magic word, so it's focused on the Latin. Hocus Corpus Meum, this is my body, and then would it be given to anybody? No, they'd have the Corpus Christi parade, but then they would take this is the body of Christ, and we'd go around the town. And then just by seeing it, all right, and then it always remains that, so then I come back to the, to the church, to the cathedral, and put it back in the tabernacle, and it always remains forever until it's consumed. It always remains the body of Christ. So in opposition to this, you have to remember the world, the culture in which our Lutheran fathers are living in, they're saying if you just have the words of institution by itself, is it the body of Christ? What do the words say? What does Jesus say? This is what our formula says. If the entire action of the Lord's Supper as Christ ordained it is not observed, if, for example, for instance, the blessed bread is not distributed, received, and eaten, but locked up, offered up, or carried about in a Corpus Christi parade, that does not make a sacrament. But what is the command of Christ? Do this. What is the this? Go back to the words. It comprehends the whole action or administration of this sacrament. Namely, that in a Christian assembly, we take bread and wine, consecrate it, but then distribute it, receive it, eat and drink it, and therewith proclaim the Lord's death, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. This must be kept integrally and inviolable, just as Paul sets the whole action of the breaking of the bread and the distribution and reception before our eyes in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 16. So go back here to the uh, catechism and let's, let's, let's take a look at this whole thing. Let's go here to how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Certainly not just eating and drinking. So it's not just the eating and drinking that gives you, because you go that way. All I got to do is just eat and drink. Well, no, 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 no. We have to have the words said too. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words, along with the bodily eating and drinking, that's what makes it, that's the main thing in the sacrament. That's what makes it a sacrament. It's the whole kit and caboodle. Because what did Jesus say on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and he gave it thanks. He broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and said, Take. He distributes it. Take. Then eat. Then the words. This is my body. Notice it doesn't say this is my body. Now, 
said that he ate it. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take eat. This is my body. So from the words of Scripture, this is what the Lutheran confessions are saying. Let's look at the whole thing. You see it in the catechism. It's not just the eating and drinking. It's the word. But it's not just the word alone. It's also the eating and drinking. It's the whole getting caboodle from the words of Jesus himself. Now, does this clear up the question? <laughs> no, it doesn't really. No, it doesn't. But that's the thing about Lutherans that makes us weird. We kind of just, and we are weirdos in Christendom. We leave the tension hanging. We leave the tension hanging to a certain extent. This is what I do know. I'll leave it there, which bothers me as a person who wants to get it all in a box and, and do it. I'll, I'll get to you in here, Shirley. Just put it in a box and get it all. Okay, this I know for sure and everything else. So that's what we see in the Catechism. This is what we see in the formula of Concord. Now, what I want to do here is then go back to Francis Pieper, who's got some quotes from Luther and other places. And, and it goes to kind of, now, what happens after the sacrament and so forth? What is, you know, what, what's, what's going on here after the service? All right, then he pulls out here. Let me make sure I got the right spot. A lot of stuff in this thing. I tried to pick the best of the best here. All right, I'm going to look at footnote 95 here on page 354 under the Lord's Supper here. In another spot in the Formula of Concord, it says, it says this: For apart from the use, this is in Solid Declaration 7, the same spot where I'm at, so we're on another page here, but I'm just going to read this together. For apart from the use, when the bread is laid aside and preserved in the sacramental vessel, the pix, the reservation of the host is put there afterwards, or is carried about in the procession and exhibited in a Corpus Christi festival, as is done in popery. They, the Lutherans, do not hold that the body of Christ is still present. That's our Lutheran confessions. So after, after. I'm just going to give you the Lutheran Confessions and let you chew on it. I don't want to get in trouble. I'm just going to leave it there. This is from the formula. Solid Declaration 7. For apart from the use, when the bread is laid aside and preserved in a sacramental vessel, when the host is put back, or later for the Roman Catholic Church, if it's carried about in a procession or exhibited in a Corpus Christi festival, as is done in Popery, they... Because this is what we condemn, and so it should be we, but one I can They, the Lutherans, because they're telling the world, we do not hold that the body of Christ is present. That's where it's at. But going back to now, for it to be there, it's got to be what? The whole, what Martin Chemnitz would call, in his book on the Lord's Supper, the whole union action has to happen. I have to have the words. I have to distribute it. I have to receive it and eat it. It's because that's the action that is put into practice. So that Francis Pieper then says, let's just then take an example. All right, now, you guys, some of you can't remember which service it was. I think it was last week. Everything's blending together now, kind of busy. But I think it was last week for a service. I dropped away from it. Yes. Was it first service? Any of there first service? I dropped it. Yes, I did. I, know. I picked it up. Shirley saw it. Too. I picked it up. I ate it. Okay. So now I I feel better about that. Okay. Now, but here's what Francis Pieper says. What happens if a wafer wafer happens to fall to the floor during the distribution, or what happens if some of the wine is spilled? What happens? Here's his answer. Christ's body does not fall to the ground, nor is Christ's blood spilled, since the entire sacramental union has not taken place. Okay. It was consecrated, it was distributed, but it wasn't received in the... Wow. That was a big thing that Luther always talked about, received in the mouth. 
Now, does it mean then that we're just nonchalant and cavalier about that which was consecrated? No. no. That's why we pour it into the piscina, or it's consumed, or so forth. But here, the Lutherans held that, hey, we have to go as much as we can. It's still a mystery, and we're still going to be very careful of what's going on here. Because it's the Word that does put it in there. But it still has to be received in the mouth. This is for you, take and eat, take and drink. This is given to you, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Because, as Luther would say, the main thing is, is that it's received by you for the forgiveness of sins is the floor receiving forgiveness. No. 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 It's for a person, for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I will be honest. Does this clear it up for me? No. <laughs> no. I'll be honest with you. It doesn't. But I've got to, I've got to finally leave it, but leave it where it is. And I went up the food chain this week to go back again to when I beat my head up against the wall in the seminary. I, I had one of them. He's with the Lord now, Professor Mark Ward. I believe he's one of the best at this. And I read all this with him, took all my classes with him. He's with the Lord now. But I, and, 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 and I struggled with it in his class. And I just, and there's so many questions by all of us as students. And he'd say, this is the best that we can do with what God has given, you, and we leave it there. That's, right. that's, that's, that's all we can do. That's, that's all we can do. And, we, and he did. He drilled it. He drilled it. We had to read all this. He gave us quizzes constantly. We had to read all this stuff. And he said, too, these are the best minds working with the Scripture texts, giving us the best answer they can give us. And we're only human, and we just have to leave it there. Yes, Jeff? Yeah, so like, on the Corpus Christi Fredo, they spread it around, and then they eventually got back together and did consume it, but why? You would still be by Christ. I mean, it's just a time delay. Jeff, I think your question is what, if I'm hearing it correctly. If they did break it around, come back, and consume it, would it be the body of Christ? Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah. The answer would be yes. But most of the time, a lot of times, it, it, it wasn't conceived. It was just in order to do the praying, you see it, and that would, be, that would be it. Or if it's put back. And again, the whole thing is, is it's... And here, I think, we have to see again something we don't understand. And that is, for the laity in Luther's day, in the Roman Catholic Church, the cup was... Withheld. They didn't, they didn't receive it. And you would have these things where they didn't give it to you. You would just show it. And then that was to be enough. And Luther said, wait, 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 wait. You're taking what away from the people? You're, you're taking, yeah, you're taking, yeah, you're taking away what? The comfort. This is for you. It's, the words are take and eat, take and drink. Not the priest drink it. And the people don't get it because was, the cup was withheld. Yes. It's take and eat, take and drink. This is my body, this is my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Does that truly answer the question in its entirety? Not really. But I think it's as close. I think it's as close as we can get. Uh, I think the pandemic, for me personally, I was near to tears to take communion after so many months of not, I was empty. I needed to fill up. So how long does it last? Every person can ask for themselves. Yeah. But for me, we're gonna I, we're gonna talk Shirley's question and her statement really with the pandemic not being able to receive the sacrament. That's why you can't do church at home. You, you need the sacrament, you need to be here. You know, the question is how often do you need it? Uh, we will that we'll tackle with the final question, God willing, and end this next week. We're out of time. But what makes a person worthy? We'll get to Chris's question. What do we need to do prior to receiving the sacrament? Luther will cover that. But then out of the gate is the question that I want to tackle that I've been receiving a lot over the last couple of years, but especially in the last couple of months. 
And that is, what about the practice of early reception of the Lord's Supper for children? That now is becoming very prevalent in the church of Greece. And kids that are five, six, seven years old, some even younger. This is a very prevalent practice. So it goes to the final question of the catechism. Who receives the sacrament worthy? And that, so I've been trying to take your questions and plug them in to a logical place in the, in the catechism. We will tackle that one. And then, um, who should be admitted to the Lord's Supper? What makes, Chris is what makes a person worthy? I think I've put them on sticky notes here, all the questions that I've got. And then surely, Jeff, the deal with, it makes a difference where you go with the confession of the altar that you had mentioned at the end. And then there was Kurtz, should I, should, should little kids play church with the sacrament at home? Which I found some very interesting on the internet. If we have time this morning, I found that actually. I didn't think we were going to get to it, but I thought, ah, oh, just in case, I better be ready. So, but those are the questions that are coming. And we will fit those into the final, what I hope is the final class. <laughs> the final class. And you guys got good questions, so I will have to admit. It's making me work. Um, the final class here for the Sacrament of the Altar and for uh, the Catechism here um, next Sunday, and that is who received the sacrament worthily. And we'll, and we'll run through that here next week. So we're out of time. Let's close in here today with a uh, word of prayer. So let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this is the day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And we give you thanks that you truly are present here. For you say where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You're here, not just spiritually, but wherever you are, there is also your earthly body, now and forever. And we give you thanks that you're here to do really just one thing, and that is to forgive our sins. And we give you thanks that we can come to your house over and over again and hear those wonderful words and receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all of our sins. May you strengthen our faith, and may that pour forth in our love for you then and in our love for one another. For we ask all this then in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.